Today we're here to discuss the top 10 things you need to know before buying an upright piano. Stick around and maybe you'll get some pointers. Hi, this is Ted with Alamo Music Center in beautiful downtown San Antonio, Texas. I'm Patrick Maher. You can find us online at alamomusic.com. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, check out our other videos, sign up for notifications, like our videos, leave us comments. We appreciate your support and we'd love to interact with you. I don't know if they're the top 10, but they're 10 reasons, 10 things you should ten. know. 10. 10 before you buy an upright piano. There are, there are probably more than 10, but these are the 10 that we think the qualified purchaser, purchaser should, <laughs> the, should, the buyer. should know. Um, and uh, we're just gonna go through them because there's a lot to know about pianos and it's a big decision. And a lot of times it can feel overwhelming and we're here to help, you know? Right. We're here to, to equip you, the buyer. Yeah, it's not a buyer beware, it's a buyer assist. Yeah, and so first rule right off the bat, not all pianos are created equal. That's kind of a disclaimer for this whole video. Um, what we're gonna be going over in this video are um, the 10 things that will most of the time guide you in the right direction. The caveat is not all pianos are created equal, so you can't take this as the end all be all of, okay, right. close their eyes and point at that unit and that's gonna be right for you. Um, so, you know, budgets change, brands change, uh, quality of instruments change. And there's a whole bunch of, of, of things that can affect your decision making. And so not all pianos are created equal, but we are gonna give you guys some really good tools to make the right decision. Um, number two, we're gonna talk about the classes of an upright piano. This is something we, we hear a lot. Right, yeah, the, what's it, what, what is a spinet? What is a console? What is an upright? What what's is a studio? A studio. Um, and what, what is the primary difference in all those? A spinet is a short one. They usually run about 42 inches. And in they're, yeah, they're shorter than 42 inches. They, they don't make them anymore. They don't make them anymore. And they haven't made them in, a, I don't think anyone has made a spin in at least 25 years. I'm, yeah, probably unless longer. I'm, unless I'm ill-advised, Ill it's, it's probably longer than that. But the idea behind a spin it was to take the traditional 52 inch or above upright and cut the soundboard in half and make two smaller pianos out of it. So, That's kind of the idea. Where so it we came would from. say, be beware of a spinet piano. There are more things that can go wrong on a spinet piano. So if you see this really cute small piano, you're like, oh, I want that one. It, sometimes with Yamaha, with Baldwin, there are some really cool spinets that you can find. Warlitzer that, made a lot. And Warlitzer, yeah. Th there's there's some there's some spinets that might be a good starting point, but for the most part, you kind of want to avoid spinets at this point. Even the most top of the line spinet that you could find, however cute it is, it's, it's worth having. It'll be a great piano, but there will always be a problem with it in the top two octaves of tuning it because where that break is on the piano, the strings are very, very short, the speaking length, and there isn't much space for a tuner to get in there and work, and it's very uncomfortable to tune a spinet. Yeah, so we, we wouldn't necessarily recommend a spinet um, unless it's very, very affordable, and that's kind of where you see people buy spinets. They're like, oh, you know, it's $500, it's $600, right. it's, it's $1,000. Um, they are very, they're priced lower than any of the other uprights, but there's a reason, and there's a reason they don't manufacture them anymore. Console, you move up a little bit taller, so that's gonna be- 45 inches. Yeah, about. 45 inches, so 42 to 45 um, is your console length. A lot of times you see those Euro style consoles um, where it doesn't have the front legs um, holding it up. It's kind right. of uh, just a-, a Continental is what they call them. Continental, it, yeah. It, here we call them Euro style, but when you go to Europe, they call them <laughs> continental style, so it's- Nobody, nobody wants to- <laughs> No one wants to recognize that the name associated with it, but they usually run about 44 and a half inches. Yeah, right? so a, a pretty good piano. That's a really good kind of intro piano. Um, the modern equivalents are, you know, a Yamaha B1, a Kawai uh, K15, um, Pearl River makes a UP118. So there, there's there's new pianos that are manufactured. Um, a lot of times, again, they're not gonna have those front legs, so they're gonna look a little bit more compact, um, gonna be a shorter uh, footprint, um, and kind of, I would say, a good starting point for- uh, A lot of them, for the most part, are really well-playing pianos. The mm -hmm. nice thing about mostly all the Euro or Continental pianos is they have international key length in it. So they are the little bit longer keys 
than what are, you would normally find on an American yeah. spinet. Yeah, and then if you if you look back in in the day, consoles you'll see a lot of you know Baldwin's, you'll see a lot of Wurlitzer's, Kimball's, um, that furniture style. Those are usually all going to be consoles as long as they're not the spinet size. Right. Um, and then you move up to um, a full upright or a studio upright, um, and that's going to be over 45 inches. Usually 47 to 48 is when people start considering it a studio instrument. So about 47 to 48, all the way up to 54 inches. Um, you don't see a lot a lot of pianos over that 54 inch right. mark anymore. So know your classification of pianos. Again, this doesn't change unless you're talking about spin it versus these other ones. It doesn't change the way the instrument plays, right. um, but it is going to be a bigger sound. It's going to be a bigger soundboard in the back. Um, and then also kind of design features are going to be different with it. Um, so really kind of just your sizing. Spin it does have a different action. It's a drop down action. So that's again, an another reason to cross spin it off your list. Um, and so uh, I think that brings us to our number three on the list, and that is looking at new and looking at used. And, and uh, you know, this is a topic we've tackled um, in a couple other videos, but we'll touch on it lightly here. Um, but what are, the, what are the benefits of going new? What are the benefits of going used? Um, and what are the, you know, what are, what, besides price, um, what, what, are you, what are the trade-offs? Uh, some of the trade-offs you get, um Again, besides price, there's nothing like a new instrument and there's nothing to motivate and inspire anyone to practice or even uh, pursue music than to have a nice, beautiful, brand new instrument. That's always the preferred choice, but financially it doesn't always work. When you get to used, there are different layers of used. Mm -hmm. There's used like, here's a 60-year-old piano. It's and, free. <laughs> and, it, and it's free. And then there's used where it's like... Uh, this is a 48-inch uh, U1 from the 70s. Mm -hmm. So there could be some really, uh, there's generally a lot of life left in a piano if you're looking at buying it. There should be. And uh, there are price considerations. The downside to having a used piano is you want to make sure that everything is functioning and proper and that it will hold a tune. 99% of the time that's usually the case. In all the years I've been here, I'd say there's probably less than a hand, uh, maybe less than 10 or 12 pianos that really could not hold a tune, and ones that had severely cracked soundboards where they were just horrid to listen to. Well, and, and so but, pure junk is out there, but don't go looking for it. Yeah, and, and a lot of the times these are the ones uh, we get calls every day. Hey, I got this piano for free, and so we're pretty selective on making sure they don't show up here at the store. Well, now this free piano. There's another good aspect about free pianos, in spite of the things that, that we've said before. The free piano does one thing. It will eventually lead to a customer coming in here to buy a better instrument. Yeah, if, so it gets you started. Yeah, it gets you started, and a lot of times, just for the cost of, of moving and tuning, you can get a piano off of Craigslist. That's great to get you going, and then that'll give you some idea of what you're looking for in an instrument when you go out to look for one. Yeah, so, so with the used instruments, uh, it is one of those, make sure you know what you're getting. A lot of the times, people can get underwater on spending all the time getting a technician, getting it delivered, and then realizing I have a 400-pound piece of junk in uh, my anchor. house. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so there, are, there are considerations to know what you're looking for. And, and further on this list, we'll kind of talk about some of the classifications of used instruments and maybe some brands and model numbers that you might want to consider. Um, but new pianos, you get a 10-year warranty. Um, you know, it's the, the, the ease of, hey, this is, you know, someone stands behind this and says, I can guarantee that you're going to get 10 years, 120 right. months of pleasure out of this instrument. It's going to function like we say it functions. So there's something to be said about that. Um, you, of course, are going to pay a little bit more for it. Um, and what we're seeing with new pianos today is people are holding on to them for a long time, but they retain their value very well, um, especially in that beginner price point. And I know it's when you look at price points of beginner instruments, it can seem you know not palatable at first, but then right. you realize that, hey, uh, uh, a U1 from 10 years ago is still worth very close what a U1 is selling for today. Um, same with a K300 from Kwai. Same with, um, you know, just these brands, they, they maintain their value because the model numbers stay the same. Um, whereas if you look at a, a 1970s uh, Baldwin Upright, it's, you know, it's worth not that much today and it will be worth even less in 10 to 15 right. years. Um, and so it kind of just depends. You don't know the story on the used instrument. Right. Now, there, there's also what falls under the category used instruments or ones that are actually remanufactured. Some places call them reconditioned, refurbished. Mm -hmm. I prefer the ones that are remanufactured where they put new strings, new pins, and they keep most of the keys. Sometimes they replace the action and the hammers. And so the one thing I do like about used, we'll end it on this point, is uh, the location of where the instrument was made. So a lot of the times you can get some cool stories out of a used instrument. Um, and unfortunately, here in America, there are not any manufacturers left besides right. a hand. There's 
three. There's Mason Hamlin, Steinway, and uh, Charles Walters. Uh, and so you start looking at, you know, Baldwin stopped manufacturing instruments in the U.S. in uh, right at the turn yeah, of the century, right, to, right in the, the, the early 2000s. And so, you know, you can find these really cool instruments that are American-made, quality-built. Um, if you look on the used market, a lot of times they're going to be priced almost close to a brand new um, beginner instrument that's made overseas at this point. So there are benefits and for And those that. instruments are usually self-selective, meaning that when a customer comes in, those are the ones they're going to select themselves. Those are the ones and the employees select for themselves. Well, yeah, 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 the employees <laughs> select for themselves as well, particularly... Uh, it seems for a while we've had a run on uh, used Yamahas that were in particular manufactured here in the United States. Yeah, those, are, those are cool stories. Um, so number four, I think this tags along well because uh, used instruments, sometimes we were talking about spinets, we are talking about sub $1,000. There is a really cool thing called an in-home digital piano, a digital piano. Um, and I, if a parent comes in, they're like, we want a piano, acoustic piano, we got $500 to spend. I'm going to say, great, let's stop looking at acoustic instruments. Let's go look at some really cool digital pianos. So you can get a good playing, good sounding, balanced instrument. With a warranty. With, it's got to take you from start, starting point to a year in, two years in. And, and it's, it's really incredible to see the value. And so if you spend anywhere from $500 to $2,500, you can spend up to six, $7,000 on these digital pianos. And they all do different things. We've highlighted a whole bunch in these videos that we have done, but really just a great value proposition for the people who are, who are very budget conscious and say, I don't want to spend more than $2,000 and I want quality. And they're super, super nice to show to an entire generation that knows nothing about digital pianos. So when you have like, uh, retiring uh, people that are retiring or they're moving into a nursing home or a different living place digital pianos are perfect for their room perfect in there because they can control the volume you put headphones on but they play and sound like a real piano even though it's not a real piano to the person that's there yeah and so we'll move on right to the next one but we'll, we'll recap not all pianos are created equal no. that's our, our first point so again a lot of this information can, you know, can be stretched one direction or the other. Um, the classification of pianos, know your differences, spin it, console, studio, upright. Uh, new versus used, we, we discussed kind of the differences and, and, and maybe why you'd want a used instrument, maybe why you'd want a new one. Uh, the option for digital is out there at a, at a very attractive price and they are filling it with more features every year, which is great. Brings us to number five. You might be looking at an upright and thinking, I can't afford a grand, or I can't fit a grand. That's why I'm looking at an upright. Or I don't want a grand because I learned on this. So we're going to kind of discuss the differences just real quickly. Is a grand piano palatable to someone who has the budget for an upright? It is. It's very viable. We've had people come in where they say, we have a $10,000 budget for an upright piano. Mm -hmm. And um, you can in that find case, it's like... $10,000, you buy a phenomenal grand. Do you have room? Do you have interest in the grand? Mm -hmm. Oh, we just didn't think we could afford one. Yeah, so, so know that your budget might include grand pianos, and there are very quality ones. You know, starting off at an affordable price range, definitely sub $10,000. Um, but the way a grand is actually manufactured um, is a different process. So the upright action um, is uh, a more mechanical action. It, it requires more mechanics to move a hammer back and forth than it does on a grand piano where you're striking the string up with the hammer and then it's falling with gravity. Relying solely on gravity, whereas the upright, it's, it relies solely on gravity, but it doesn't work. So, it, it's so repetition, same. things, things uh, with a grand piano, you can, uh, and this is a generalization, but with most grands, you can play more precise, more accurately than with an upright. And again, there are some uprights that are better than grands. I'm not, I'm not gonna say that. Um, but generally speaking, a grand piano can feel better, can sound better, um, and is beautiful. <laughs> well, it might mean more to the musician as well, too. Mm -hmm. So there are differences. They're not just the way they're, does, they're not they're just the way they look. An upright and a grand have differences. Um, and if you um, are interested in a grand, we would recommend, you know, looking at both those and comparing the two and say, hey, which one might be right for me? Um, because a grand has a lot to offer. Um, but an upright also has a lot to offer and put up against a wall. Um, you get reflection back at you. Um, you can prop the lid up. You can, you know, have it in a very tight space. It's, e it's relatively easy for two or three people to move around. Um, there are benefits to an upright. So just know your options are open um, if you are just, you have been zeroed in on upright and haven't known the differences between a grand and an upright. That's true. So number six, we're going to talk about 
how an upright works in general terms to the everyday player. Um, and so what is, what, when I strike a string on, or strike a note on an upright, what is actually happening? Is it, because if, if I think about like a little portable keyboard, there's keys just like this, and when I hit one, a note goes off, right? Mm -hmm. So what's, what's the difference with me hitting a note here on this and then hitting a note on like a little portable keyboard? The difference is the portable keyboard, when you hit it, is electronically triggered to play a recording of a, of a note. Mm -hmm. And on here, when you play, push a key, there's a mechanical it's device a long that key goes too, to a right? long key that eventually pushes the action up to where the hammer hits three strings for the most part. I mean, the lower one's going to be two and one, but it's going to hit three strings and retract, and then you can control when the damper goes back either with the sustain pedal or just letting go with the key. Mm -hmm. uh, those differences show up when you play it. When you play a digital piano, you get some vibration, but you don't get a whole room of vibration. There isn't, any, there, there isn't really any oscillation in a digital piano. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a repeater. It's playing a recorded note. It's looping it. It's looping it. A piano actually has vibrating strings that are oscillating because they're vibrating and that's what's making the noise and, and it gets amplified through the bridge and the soundboard. Yeah, so then the bridge hits like a guitar or like a violin. It, it starts to, it takes the sound and it vibrates and it through the soundboard. it takes it to the box and it gets boomed out. Mm -hmm. So really a cool experience playing an upright acoustic instrument. Um, it is something that is a little bit magical. You know, our, our, our whole being is, is frequencies. We talk, right. we communicate um, with frequencies. When this thing is ringing, you're through your fingertips, through the through, through the, the room. Seat on the pedal. Uh, it's and so speaking of the pedals, is it like driving a car? Do I need to like? Does it have no, to? No, the pedals don't require that much. They're just a yeah. mechanical movement, and they do a couple different things. The most important one is your sustain. Well, most people use the sustain pedal. Your very That's far right pedal. A lot of times, beginners will just will step on it and not look back. They'll hold right. it down the whole time they're playing. It does sound. Really cool to hold a sustained note and then play. It's a little bit more, you know, legato. It's, right. it's, it's, uh, Everything kind of blends together. And so it's a, it's a good cover up. But for the most part, people, the inexperienced player will not use the other two pedals for a while unless. Well, if they're, una corda is the far left pedal. Mm -hmm. And that literally means one string. And that's from when they mostly had two strings on piano. What it does on a grand piano is it shifts so you're only playing one string. The way they adapted it for an upright. Damper, is, yeah. is, is it actually moves the hammers closer to the string so they don't travel as far, so they're not going to be hitting with as much force or torque, so it's going to have a lower volume. Mm -hmm. On an upright piano, when you depress the una corda pedal, you get a lower volume. You get hardly any change in intonation. The intonation change you get is a reduced volume. On a grand piano, you go from hitting three strings to two strings, or from two strings to one string. Mm -hmm. And then the middle pedal uh, on most pianos today. Oh, uprights, they're fun because it could be all kind of stuff. Yeah, on most, but on, the, on most of them you'll see uh, it's called like the quiet pedal. And what it does is. Um, Muter practice. Yeah, it, it puts a piece of felt between the, sh the hammers and the strings. So, you know, basically it's, it's hitting with way less attack because there's a, there's a medium between the strings and the hammer. So it, it kind of dampens the whole sound. It usually you press it down and you slide it to the left and it, and it activates that it way. It locks in. On the very fancy uprights, could be a sustain noodle pedal, um, but yeah, it does it does different things, um, and so that's basically how the piano works. The upright piano, there's not a lot to it once you start playing all 88 keys. And yes, most of them have 88 keys. You might see a couple that have 85. Or there could be some 85s, and then there's also a few that are like, I think like around 80. Yeah, they they, do, they made these little. So make sure you're looking at one with 88 keys. It's probably worth it. They don't make a lot anymore that are new with less. Um, Let's talk about brands. Number seven on our list is know, know the brands, um, know generally what is a quality instrument, um, and especially today, um, there are all, only a few that are left around. Um, but let's talk about some of our favorite brands. Well, brands that come up are different in used pianos because there's a lot of them that are still in inventory, uh, if not here in some other place. They're still around. They're, they're going to eventually be for sale. But naturally, the first brand people always ask for when we come in is, is when they're looking for a quality upright and they always ask for a Yamaha or a Kawhi or an old Baldwin. And it's funny because when they come in to ask for a Grand, they ask for a Steinway. But Steinway made some great upright pianos that, were, that are consoles, non-furniture as well. And hardly anyone ever asked for a Steinway upright. Yeah, no, they, uh, they, they really don't. And so, yeah, so those are a couple great brands right there. Yamaha, Kawhi, 
Baldwin, Steinway's a good place if you can afford it. Um, Behind us is actually a cool story. So Schimmel is a great manufacturer, usually priced pretty heavily above what people are comfortable buying, especially a first time buyer. And um, for an upright too, Schimmels uh, are expensive, but they're worth it. And so Schimmel uh, is a great brand, but they were purchased by a, a, the largest manufacturer of piano, Pearl River, um, who makes Rittmuller. They make this uh, Friedelin uh, behind us for Schimmel, but Pearl River is a great manufacturer who has made pianos for Steinway. They make the S6 piano for Steinway. Um, and they made pianos for Yamaha back in the day. Um, so they're just a quality instrument. There's some great brands coming out of China and out of Korea. The Samic is, an, is a wonderful brand. Young Chang is a young, young, wonderful brand. Um, but yeah, these, these names are the ones that you're going to see a lot of the times. Um, the names of the past, like Wurlitzer, um, Kimball, uh, they're getting harder to find. They're getting we're, harder we're, to find, but sometimes you'll see some stencil names with them. Um, that's mostly going to be from the Samet group. They made yeah. a lot of stencil pianos, both uprights and uh, grants. Yeah, so so uh, there's definitely a, a longer list. There's a name. There's 10,000 piano brands that have ever been, been around, and so there's a lot of them. But for the most part, those are the majority of kind of quality ones that you're going to see see and and hopefully you know pick something within that range is a safe bet. Um, there are also ones outside of that range that we're not we won't go through an exhaustive list, but but that, that are good quality as well. But do a little research, look up the brand. That's an important part of how quality the instrument is is knowing kind of the story behind it. Um, so brands can be very, very important. Um, we'll talk about number eight, styles of instruments um, and the finishes and the features of them. We did already touch on the pedals, um, but maybe something like this slow close lid um, is something that people don't know that they want, but maybe they don't want their little kids' hands to get smashed when they're mm -hmm. playing the instrument. Um, there are cool features um, like the quiet pedal. Um, there's technology nowadays that comes out on upright pianos that are, you know, a silent system. So you can make the whole thing quiet and put right. headphones on. Um, features, there's different finishes. What are, what are some of your favorite? Oh, well, the finishes, this is favorite finish. I have to tell you, a lot of people like uprights in, in either a dark oak or a light oak. And that, that's a lot of, we sold a lot of uprights of various manufacturers, mm -hmm. not just Yamahas that are light oak and dark oak. If you take that light oak and dark oak and you put it on a grand piano, you have kind of almost an eyesore. You have a slow moving piano. And I'm thinking of the sale that um, they sold today. Mm -hmm. And it was a gorgeous, what, five foot two? Yeah, oak finish. Oak, light oak finish. Uh, Wurlitzer piano. It was manufactured up by uh, Samic, mm -hmm. and it was a stencil piano, but it had great action. It sounded great. It had hardly ever been played. The only problem with it is it looked like it belonged in a church. So yeah, so fair warning on finishes. The more uh, trendy it is, the, the quicker it gets untrendy. Yeah, uh, it becomes dated. <laughs> yeah, and so, and so I, I think like especially when I was young, the, the white oak, like it reminds me of like a cafeteria and like there's the Yamaha P22 and oak. Right. Um, but just, just when selecting a finish, there's a lot of options. There's, you know, mahogany, there's uh, uh, polished, so like a high gloss and like this. satin ebony, polished ebony. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, the satin ebony pianos in Grange, everyone, oh, I just want a flat black piano. Yeah. And now everyone wants the shiny a polished shiny and then they come in white they come in black they come in yeah again mahogany there's red finishes there's blue finishes we've seen some really cool instruments over the years and then sometimes they use exotic woods on it so right. babinga um there's just pyramid mahogany this one we saw recently um just really cool stuff walnut and so uh so just know that the finishes are out there the more exotic you get with it sometimes um you know, sometimes the harder it is to retain well, the value in it. Now, lately, we've had a number of people coming in to buy um, 1950s looking Art Deco type pianos. Mid-century, yeah. Mid-century. They want it because it matches their aluminum edged kitchen table and chairs they have. That They want their place to look like 50-ish. So there's been, and these are some of the um, pianos that have those straight down spindled legs like mm -hmm. a table leg there's nothing fancy it's, like, it's yeah. just a rounded leg that goes to a point up front 
So yeah, there's a lot. A lot of times, people go out deliberately looking for a certain style of piano. Yeah, and so it, what comes around goes around, and it right. changes. But um, there is a traditional look, and then there's like you know the the more uh, exotic, more uh, daring. Um, right. And so uh, you don't see a lot of wood carved pianos anymore. A lot of furniture, home style. That that's, is something that will be harder to find, and you'll have to go kind of to the used market to find something that's you know more obscure and more carved out, more decorated. Um, a lot of times, you see a lot you know sh chic black. Right. And, and hard lines. Um, so that's kind of styles and finishes. Again, you know, there's some really cool technology with silent pianos and with like hybrid digitals and acoustics. Um, so make sure you look at that as a possibility if you have certain requests, like I want to play in the middle of the night or you right. know, I have a baby who, and I don't want to wake them up. Um, and so that kind, of round, yeah, that kind of rounds out eight for us. Nine, consultation. Oh, this is the most important thing. If you have access to um, say a friend that's a technician, uh, a piano technician or a tuner, uh, a teacher, uh, even someone that plays or a performer, or better yet, a store like Alamo Music Center. Something, somebody, somebody that you trust. And so, so yeah, look, maybe there's a store around your area that, that has very trusting you know, reviews, has a good reputation. Um, but yeah, having a friend that you can, you can tag along with that plays, having a teacher that you trust that taught you to play or teaching your children to play. Um, and then finding a technician is always, you know, that's one of the harder ones, but you can hire a technician on a day rate and say, hey, can you come with me? I have a piano picked out. I want you to, to look it over. Right. Um, sometimes stores will do this for you, but, you know, if you don't trust them and you want you to get, consult your own um, your oh, own. Oh, a person. lot of people come in here with their own yeah, tuner and, or tech. And, it's, and stores will love it because, you know, they want they want to say, hey, this is a quality and we have a warranty and, and all that. So, Absolutely. Um, so this is just uh, number nine on the list. Con consultation, seek out help. Um, there's plenty of people loving to start you on the journey of music because it's it's an incredible thing. And for this instance too, there's also one of the oldest uh, known piano pages out there called Piano World. It's a great site. Yeah, you can a put big blog. A yeah. big giant blog. Tons of topics. Yeah. So just just know just know there are, there are resources for you. Um, and number ten, trust your ears. Don't trust your ears. Yes, yeah, trust them, but don't trust them. So. Know to what to listen for. If you hear rattling, clinking, banging, no sound, those are probably bad things. Yeah. If it sounds out of tune and doesn't sound sweet, that's something that can be changed pretty e uh, easily. Um, and if it sounds just wonderful, right, at, right to go, you, know, you can trust your ears. Um, a lot of the times um, people will make the decision because, oh, this sounds excellent, this sounds wonderful. And, um, and a lot of times it's, it's an emotional thing. It's a, it's a subjective experience and it can be an emotional bonding experience where, hey, this thing resonates with me. I want this one. That's how people pick their instruments. And it's, and it's cool, but, but also trust your ears. And if something doesn't sound right, even if the salesperson you're talking to doesn't sound right. That's what I meant by don't trust your ears. <laughs> if they tell you it'll be perfect when it gets delivered to your house, maybe you go a day before it gets delivered to your house to make sure it's perfect. So just to recap all 10, not all panels are created equal. The classifications of pianos, know those. Know new versus used. There might be a great new one, there might be a great used one that you weren't considering. Um, no, digital pianos are available and incredible value at certain price points and sometimes even a better value than the uh, corresponding acoustic. Um, know that grands are available if you have the space, if you have a budget in mind and, and grands fit in that. Sometimes grands might be a better choice for you. Um, we talked about how the piano works kind of just briefly. It's a very cool experience. I think kind of puts it above a digital when you start to think about the acoustic qualities of it, especially in certain price ranges. Um, seven, we talked about the brands. Make sure you're buying a reputable brand that people are saying relatively good things about. Um, people can get nitpicky, but generally speaking, if you, if you go and Google a brand and if they're saying good things about it, you can trust that that's probably a good purchase. Eight, there are styles and finishes and features that you might not have considered. And uh, it's good to kind of experiment with, hey, do I want a silent system? Do I want a cool, unique finish? What am I looking for here? Right. Um, number nine, make sure you seek consultation if you have a friend, if you have a teacher, if you have a technician, um, or if there's a reputable store in your area, make sure you find someone trustworthy and, and just be honest with them, be open and say, this is what my goal is and this is what I want to do. And then 10 to round it all off, trust your ears, but... Don't trust your ears. 
you guys are going to make great decisions in finding the right piano for you. We are here to help. If you have any questions, we are Alamo Music Center in San Antonio, Texas. You can find us online at alamomusic.com. We do have some stores in Kansas City, St. Louis, store in Austin. So we are in other places as well. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out alamomusic.com or give us a call. Thanks for watching.